Welcome everybody to the understanding of architecture classes with the Takaho Public Library. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm honored to share with you about a little bit about architecture and empower you with more knowledge of this beautiful discipline that surrounds all of us. Well, I have to tell you before I start sharing the slides for today's class, that we're going to be able, hopefully, by the end of the class, by 6 p.m., we're going to be able to draw at least our own living room, our own bedroom, by the end of the class. How exciting is that? And even better, to scale. Isn't that great? Okay. And as uh, Marjorie was saying about seeing with different eyes, I hope during this past two weeks you were able to walk around the village your municipality or wherever you are with different eyes, but trying to understand the proportions of the sidewalk, the door you walked through, the size of the window, if there was come enough light coming through, the ceiling height, the ceiling um, finish, the type of uh, illumination that you had. Was it a warm color? Was it a cold color? If you had to go to a doctor's office, a dentist's office, did it feel very different than your own home? All of those small details are part of what we call architecture. So welcome to our second class. Let's start sharing this screen and see what we can appreciate and learn today. Let's go. So today our goal is to learn the techniques on how to draw and understand an architectural set of drawings. And that includes floor plans, elevations, also what we call sections, and much, much more. Thank you again to the Takaho Public Library and the Westchester County Board of Legislators. As I said, today's class will really empower and inspire you to create a better built environment. What do I mean by saying that? I mean that in the next few minutes, we will encapsulate the basics of the architecture, architectural process. Yes, there is a process behind everything that we see as architecture. And it goes all the way from programming to uh, construction. Okay, so that's all part of the deal. And part, oh, let me go back. Part of, part of the architecture's scope of work these days is also ac accessibility. Have you heard about accessibility before? Raise your hand. Very important, right? Why is that very important? Because it brings everybody to the right of enjoy architecture and our own municipalities, our, our own buildings, our own homes. With principles of inclusion in mind, architecture now more than ever aggregates and accommodates a lot of different needs. We will talk about it during our class and you will be be able to understand the concept um, that we have behind this. The architectural process seems to be a place where everything is possible. Did you ever think about it? In architecture, everything is possible. Marjorie said she's a writer. In writing, also everything is possible, right, Marjorie? Yes, in architecture, everything is possible as well. It seems to be at least, and it might be, it might very well be, it's close to that, at least. In fact, it is a body of knowledge that incorporates materials, structure, craft, ideas, health, ergonomics, psychology, creativity, passion, sensibility, and much more. Without much further ado, everybody, I would now like to welcome you to our second class. Let's enjoy the ride. And I know some of you told me, I have my notepad here, I have my pencil, I have my pen, please make lots of notes, write your insights and make it unforgettable. We're going to have time to discuss it at the end of the class, okay? The materials we suggested I'm going to repeat today, I always suggest you have a notepad. If you have graph paper is what is really ideal. Flare felt tip black pen is also uh, suggested because it makes it much easier for you to draw. Whatever you have is fine, but if you want to get that to get the full experience of sketching, that would be perfect. An eraser, a mechanical pen, so as long as you have HB kind of uh, um, drawing tool inside, 0 0.9 would make your experience also much better. I feel highlighters, and 
a camera for photo because I'm going to be sharing a few websites and a few book names with you. So if you want to use your phone to take photos of the screen, that would be perfect. And as you know, as I always say, what we need, the best material to have is a very curious mind, ask questions. Stay sharp because now is the time to learn. Let's go. Please keep writing down your possible comments or questions and uh, we will allow some time at the end to go through it all. Thank you so much. Now let's ask, where do we start with architecture? To the right, you see a picture of a house. You see a picture of a school and a picture of the hospital. And this is all architecture. Where do we start? Do we start from the same place? Well, let's start by giving the definition of architecture, right? Architecture in the dictionary, it's called the art and technique of designing and building. So it's not only what we have on the paper, right? As distinguished from the skills associated with construction, the practice of architecture is employed to fulfill. And that's very important. Let's go through it very carefully. It's employed to fulfill both practical and expressive requirement, requirements. And thus it serves both utilitarian and aesthetic ends. Think about it. These two ends cannot be separate and the relative weight given to each can vary widely. If you are confused by what I just said, raise your hand. A little bit, right? <laughs> what do I mean by that? Look at this house to the right. This house in our right-hand side has one utilitarian and aesthetic going together, right? It has to have the right size in the living room, the kitchen, the bedroom. It's very practical and aesthetic important as well. But now think about a school. Do we have to think about how big those classrooms have to be? How many escapes for fire egress those classrooms must have? Or how wide that corridor needs to be for the amount of kids? All of those factors go into um, decision-making process, right? But now think about it. Because every society, settled or nomadic, has a spatial relationship to the natural world and to other so uh, societies. The structures they produce reveal much about their environment. And that includes climate and weather, history, ceremonies, and artistic sensibility, as well as many aspects of daily life. Think about, for example, places of worship how much it varies depending on people's beliefs and faith everywhere around the world. Now think about schools, a school down in South America in a place where it's really hot and they might not have enough money to have air conditioning. So you have to think about big windows or big balconies or cross ventilation. So all of those factors are part of what we call architecture and the process of the basics of architecture. Now, if we go into details and try to summarize of it, all of that, I would give you three main characteristics that distinguish a work of architecture from other built structures. And here they are. If you go to the lower um, paragraph, the number one is the suitability of the work to use by human beings in general and the adaptability of it to particular human activities. And these are part of the examples we just gave. Think about a firehouse. How many of you ever went to a firehouse, right? Does it have to be a certain height to have that big fire truck to go through? Does he have to have a certain type of floor? So those are characteristics that distinguish this work of architecture from other beauty structures. The stability and performance of the work's construction is the number two. And finally, number three is the communication of experience and ideas through its form. All these conditions must be met in architecture. You can have only one thing or the other. So now one of the things that we have is to understand that there is dimension behind everything. So if you have the graph paper, Let's use it today. If you don't, you can have it later on and try to do these exercises in a later time. But think about it. With a graphic graph paper, 
we're going to remember those words today. Scale, proportion, and human scale. That's very different. And we're going to use those three words throughout the class today. I don't know if you know, but this is our represent because this was tailored also for kids 14 up. So I made sure to bring here that this is the symbol for inches and this is the symbol to represent feet. And on the right hand side, we have the units of length that we use in the United States. So one foot equals 12 inches. One yard, and that's the abbreviation for the yard, equals three feet. One yard can also be 36 inches, which is the conversion, right? We multiply three by 12, and that gives us 36 inches. One mile, which abbreviation is MI, is a total of 1,760 yards and can also be 5,280 feet when we multiply. Some of you may have seen this before. That's what we call the architecture's scale or ruler. And that gives us different scale. For example, here you have featured the 16th scale, 3 16th, 1 8th, 1 uh, half an inch, 1 and a half, and 3 eighths, for example. And that's how we represent the drawing and we make it able to fit in a probably construction set of drawings, or that's what's going to be used by your contractor to build. And this is our tape measurement that we use to get dimensions probably from the real world to get into the drawings. And that's where we're going to represent using the special rulers. Most of the architects, they, they go to the job site and they use this laser these days. Have you ever seen this? This is called, well, if you, most of the architects call it by the name of the brand, which is Leica. They call it the Leica Distal. And what you do, you see the very base of this tool, you place it against the wall, and then you shoot a laser by clicking on the red button. And it goes, the laser goes all the way to the target, which is usually the end of the wall. And that gives you a total dimension. If you look into details right here on the right hand side, that is the drawing of the distal showing where it's coming from the dimension all the way to the wall. That makes it much faster than the tape measurement, but sometimes you still need the tape measurement. Now that you know the scale system, you can try to do it yourself. And then you might ask me, say, Carolina, I don't know it yet. What are you talking about? Well, I'm talking about how a graph paper can help us in the beginning. For example, this was drawn, as you see here, each square was equivalent to a certain dimension and they called it a quarter inch equals one foot. So I'm gonna go back, but just so you understand, what this will allow us to do is to see inside. And some of you may have seen a few books that are called See Inside. Have you seen this before? See Inside? Okay, so what these books do, they tell you what buildings, architecture or ships or other places, what they look inside to represent that in a less architectural way, what they do is they cut. Imagine if you're cutting a cake, right? Imagine this piece of architecture is a cake. They slice a cake and then you start seeing inside. If you go to this view on the right, which is the book called uh, The Story of Buildings, if you look at the base of this section here, if, you, if it was a cake, you would slice it. And then if you see from above, that would be called a floor plan. So a floor plan is nothing more, nothing less to keep, uh, than a slice in the building. That's what it is. Have you ever thought about it? Did you ever see a floor plan in your life? Let me go back to the other page. You see here, that's a slice. You're slicing a building horizontally. So that's how you see a wall in a horizontal section. That's how you see a door in a horizontal section. But then you say, Carolina, I don't see this line. What is that? That's what we call the door swing. It gives you an idea on what direction the door is swinging. So in this place, this is the door seen from above. And this is indicating that it's swinging to the left. This, for example, is showing that it's a double door and it swings out. It's not sw swinging in the room. All of these are ways to be representing your room in a floor plan. 
So to the right, for instance, you're seeing the window and this should probably be your convector cover below the window with your radiator heater, right? So if you're writing a section, which usually in a floor plan is a section, is a slice of the building at three feet, six inches above the finished floor. And then you look below as if you were writing around your home and someone got a knife and cut that entire place at three feet, uh, six inches above the finished floor. Isn't that interesting? Look around, take this moment to look around your room and imagine that happening. Would you see that door just like this? But you wouldn't see the door swing, right? Look at the window behind you. Wouldn't it look just like this representation here? That line would be the glass in the middle of it. So basically, this kind of books right here are giving us a more an easier way to understand what floor plan are. A section, for example, would be this slice right here in the middle of the book, looking inside the building. An elevation would be a view from the outside of the building, would show us what all the uh, exteriors are. The facade, it's also outside. It's specifically outside. Elevation can also be inside. Details is when we really need to understand how to build something. So most of the time we get details from the type of wall, the type of window, the type of ceiling, or how something is going to be built. And perspectives, most of the time they help us understand how this is going to be installed or how you can sell that idea to the client. Shop drawings, it's another term we use in architecture that will define how things are going to be built as well and can be for a variety of things. New work drawings usually specified for cabinetry. And once the architect does it, he goes to a shop where things are going to be built. They create what we call the new work drawings and it goes to the architect to reveal to ensure that things are going to be built as per design. And construction drawings are a set of drawings that are going to go all the way to the builder and he will make sure that it's built as per the drawings. Has many pages, usually comes with a table of contents or a drawings index on the first page, which is similar to when we read a book. Did you ever read a book without a table of contents? Not really, right? You need that. The same thing with the architect. So when these drawings go to the job site or goes to the municipality for plan examination, we need to know where to find architectural drawings, mechanical drawings, and so on and so forth. Okay, so now that we know a little bit of the basics, let's start by trying to draw a tiny house. Have you ever heard about tiny house? All right, so why did I pick a tiny house to explain? Well, because we have limited time, right? So limited time, limited dimensions. That's what I had in mind. <laughs> let's start with a tiny house. So on the left, let's start our practice by trying to draw a tiny house. And this will allow us to learn how to draw a floor plan. Additionally, it will help us communicate ideas to turn them into real and most importantly, workable design. To the left here, I brought a sample of what we call a graph paper, right? If we can choose what we want each square to be the unit in place. So in this case here, I'm using the graph paper to represent each square a six inches unit. In other words, when I get a two squares by two squares size, I am representing a 12 inches or one foot. And if I represent 24 inches or two feet, it would be double that. So it'd be one, two, plus one, two, four squares, plus one, two, one, two. So this is 36. So I have one, two, three, four, five, six, times six gave me 36. And that's how we can represent. I welcome you to take photos of the screen because we might forget later on. So please feel free to take as many photos as you would like. So getting started, I like to suggest, people are different, but I do like to suggest people to start the old fashioned way. What do I mean by that? Yes, a, base, a piece of paper, a pencil and a pen. 
because I truly believe that most great ideas start out with a quick sketch on a paper. And that goes to show that every beautiful building that we know in history has a piece of architecture on a piece of paper, right? It always starts with a sketch, but a drawing is more useful when it's done to scale. And that's why I'm starting by letting you know how to use the basics of scale, allowing you to understand the size of the element elements that you are trying to introduce and the relationship to each other. For example, if you are drawing your own living room, you want that living room to have a sofa that fits properly, right? or you have a coffee table that you're going to buy that will allow you enough space to pass through or when you open the door that new piece of furniture you're going to get won't be in the middle of your way right so graph paper makes it very easy to draw to scale remember you can if you if you don't have one and you don't want to buy one you can always print your own if you put graph paper on google you'll probably go to image you will allow you to print that Use a pencil, a pen, a magic marker, or whatever works for you. You will want to um, each square of the grid to be equal or uh, to a fraction of a foot, like three, four, six inches, or even a foot. In this case here, I use six inches to make it easier for you because we join a tiny house. So you can choose any of those, right? So in this case, I spelled out what that could be. If you choose one of these let's say six inches and multiply it by the number of grid squares on your graph paper, say 30 by 39, that gives 180 by 234 inches, or in other words, 15 by 19 and a half feet. Divide each inches by 12 to get feet, right? That's how we get feet. One foot right here on the left equals 12 inches. So at that scale on that piece of paper, you have room to draw something up to 15 feet wide by 19 feet and six inches long. A 24 inch square table would be four grid squares long by four grid squares wide. It might sound confusing, but it's much easier once you get started, right? All right, so this is an example of a tiny house floor plan draw on a graph paper. Let's go it little by little because it might sound overwhelming when we look at it uh, quickly, right? So let's start with this perimeter right here. Can, who can tell me what this perimeter means? Is that a wall? Do you think it's a wall? Yes, if you said yes, it is a wall. So this is representing walls, usually shaded because think about it. When you do a section on your wall and you look down, it's not hollow, right? Most of the time, the exterior walls are made out of uh, brick and mortar, or maybe they will be made out of metal studs and chipboard and other finish. So the basic way to represent walls is with a certain thicknesses, Exterior walls can vary widely, but let's say in here, if our graph paper is representing six inches, this is a little bit less than six, probably five and three eighths. So we used in this tiny house, the representation for the exterior walls to be six inches. And this is how we walk in into our home. You see these two lines, nothing is just a decoration they mean something, or at least they should mean something. So that's probably meaning a step up to the room. And then here is your door. It even says here, two foot, eight inches front door, and it has an arrow. So this is the door, but the door doesn't have a line that does this quarter circle, right? So who, remember what, who remembers what this is? The door swing, right? Yes, Marjorie. Marjorie already showed me the swing. So it's swing, swinging to the right. And usually in architecture, you even think about what goes behind there. Usually you have something to protect your wall, right? A door stop. So that would go in what we call the details or on the elevation showing what height that would be. So your doorknob doesn't knock down that wall and makes it look bad. And by the end of the day, the, the person living there say, why how come the architect didn't tell me about the door stop, right? And to the right of the door, what is that? 
that is what we call openings. Openings are usually away from the exterior corners where possible. Does anybody know why? why? They are as away as possible from the corner for stability. Because the moment we poke through a wall for anything, especially for openings, we lose the stability. So wind is a problem, right? So all the natural forces of our planet have to be remembered because this is part of keeping it strong. This is how we represent a window. So this is part of the window frame. And this is how we see the glass from above. Now, even the weight of the lines matter. You see here how this line is thicker than this? Do you know why? No, right? But that matters too. The reason why, remember I told you we are slicing through the building horizontally. So when we slice a wall, we are cutting that piece of structure. But when we slice a glass, look at your window behind you. This is thick because it's the glass, but this is going to be seen way down below, which is the window sill. So you got to show in relationship to what we see. That's why this line is thinner than this one. So going here, this is the mullion and it's represented as such. And it's thick because when you cut a mullion, again, it's a structure, right? And this is how we go around perimeter. Now here, this is separating the bathroom. That's how we represent a toilet. And this is how we represent a shower. Now you see here, it's called pocket door. Imagine if you were seeing the pocket door from above, this would slide inside the wall. That's how it's simply represented. You can have much more detail, but in a simple way, that's how you would see the pocket door is different than the door that swings. You see, we don't have that being represented here. So now let's go back to our entry door and see how this tiny house looks. This is a sofa being represented in a floor plan. So you can actually see what is the sofa arm, the back of the sofa, the left-hand side arm, and the three seats. So that's how you would represent a three-seater sofa. Interesting, right? So now we, we are able to see floor plan and say, wow, that's how we see it. And we even be able to say how big that is. So let's say, let's count together. One, two, three, four, and probably a half. So one, two, three, four times six, right? Plus half of a square would be three inches. So that's about a 30 to 35 inches deep sofa. How cool is that? Right? We didn't even have a dimension, but now we know how big that is. How wide? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen and a half. So now we know how wide that is. It's almost a 70 or a little bit more than 70 inches wide. We know exactly what you expect for the sofa, how many people can see it. We know how much space we have between the sofa and this desk. How do we know it's a desk? Well, this is how we're representing a chair, right? The arms of the chair, the back, and the seat. There is a variety of it, but they chose this one. And this will be a counter surface. Now, look at this. Any guess of what that could be? You got it, the sink counter, Jenny, exactly. Usually, it comes with the representation of the faucet, and this would be the drain. And in dashed lines, that's how we represent what is above the cutted area. So we did cut at three feet, six inches, right? But we still want to show the contractor or the users what is above that. So the way we represented that is through dashed lines. So that's probably showing that the counter is free from cabinetry, but what is above is here. So we probably have a cabinet on the left and a cabinet on the right. And that is applying also for what we have across you see, this is representing a four uh, outlet oven. Look at that. Stove top. And that's representing 12 inches deep cabinets above pool, right? So now we know what is in our level of three feet, six, three feet, six inches and below, and also what is represented above. 
And now if we go to the bathroom, that's how they would represent a toilet. And this is how we would represent a shower. Now, can you imagine why it would be an X with a circle at the end, uh, in the middle? The reason why what Lilia said, this is the drain, is so important to understand. Look at that. That's the drain, yes. But if the contractor sees the drain here and he doesn't see these lines, what's going to happen to this water? The water is going to run outside and it's going to get this entire house <laughs> to have a flood. So what this line represents is that there is a peak. This is directing the water to the center. This is directing the water to the center. This is directing to here and same thing here. And this is representing there is a transition between here and here. Same thing when you get into the house. You see another line? There is a transition to get into the house. So now I guess we know much better how to read a floor plan, right? Next time we see a floor plan, we're going to know a lot more. So this just tells a little bit of what we went through, right? Wall thickness is important and it's easy to do. Right here, you see a little bit better, there's not shaded. So if one grid square is six by six, then this wall here, they, they're telling us it's about four inches and a half, right? Uh, and same thing with the doors. The doors have a limited um, size and they come in uh, specific increments. And also about floor plan, it's very important to be realistic about furniture. It happens. I'm going to say it here, and some people by, just might start saying, I had an architect working for me, a designer working for me. They said I could fit a three-seater sofa in my living room. I went to buy one, and it didn't fit more than a two-seater. What happened? It's because there is a variety, a huge variety of furnitures out there. we got to be realistic about what can uh, fit and what cannot in a space. So get out a measuring tape. Uh, and measure your furniture and be aware of what you want to buy in your space, right? Usually there is a standard dimension and that's what we call the ergonomics. So to the left here, if you look at it, there is a, you see letter A? Every chair has a minimum and a maximum height that it must have. For example, I help with the designs in hospitals. Patient chairs have a certain amount that is very important. So let's say if they had a surgery, they got to be able to stand up and sit down quickly or, or patients with a, um, canes, they need extra support. So how high should that arm on the chair be? Here you see there is a certain height for your counter, for the back. All of this are part of what we call human scale. Remember that word in the beginning? that we should remember. So we spoke about scale. Now we're talking about human scale. And there are also what we call proportions, right? Let's say, for example, you have a certain window in a room. The proportion of the window to the room is even part of what we account as the minimum light, natural light that is necessary in certain rooms. So other things that are, are going to be part of designing a space are what we call plumbing walls. Did you ever think about what goes behind the area where you have your shower head, what goes behind where you have your toilet or your sink? There is what we call plumbing wall. And it's very important to tell that when someone is poking a hole or hanging a, a, a nice, beautiful artwork, because you don't want to poke through a plumbing wall without, without knowing what's there. Uh, and then sheer walls, narrow house usually have sheer walls, but we got to move fast. Also invite you to take a photo of this. This is a, an example of an elevation of our tiny house. Elevations are important to understand where things go and how tall they are. So for example, in here, we know where ground level is and we tell that. You see this is the symbol that represents level. And here it says minus. When it says minus, that means it's below grade, right? So it says ground level minus because we're choosing the grade level to be zero, zero. And that's where we labeling finished floor. Then the bottom of the windows, we're giving a specific dimension. So when the contractor is there, although he saw the window being represented here on the plan, 
It doesn't know how tall it starts. That's why we need elevations. The top of with the window is also important. So we know if things are aligned, if the top of the window, for example, is the same height of the door and the top of wall plate. So we know where this roof is going to end so they can finish the construction of that wall. Usually we call it the ceiling height as well. And finally, but not um, the end of our class yet, is the top of the roof. Look at that. We got to know where this is, right? The, re the eave. And usually we have a maximum allowable height for any construction. We spoke about floor plan elevation. Now, now let's talk about cross section. Remember this book here? Let's go back. The see inside book. Look at the section, right? We were able to see inside. Now with the, an architecture cross section, this is what it looks like. We're seeing inside the roof. We're seeing that's the window, a cut through the window. We're seeing the countertops for both kitchen sink and kitchen uh, stovetop. And this is a more um, a clear version of this here, you see, without the graph paper behind. But we start saying what is going to look like. And one of the ways we represent things and understand how they're going to be built is by giving a number or a letter. In this case, the architect chose to give numbers. So number one, we're giving um, the uh, important heights. Number six, we're saying that the elevation is visible behind section cut. Now, if you want to learn how to do that more than just um, in the, on the paper, you can do it on something called SketchUp. And SketchUp is a free 3D resource that is funded by Google. And they have this website where you can even do a training for free and start doing it in the computer. I start it always by hand. And then if I need to bring to 3D, I go. And here are other tutorials on how to draw floor plans that will guide you through a step-by-step -step with more time than in our one 60-minute uh, session. So I invite you to take photos of this page and go for it if you want to dig into it further. Try to draw your own bedroom, your own living room, your own kitchen, and bring it to the next class. Can I ask you for that? It's not mandatory in any way, but I would love to see you inspired by the class and what that can bring you to, okay? This is what it looks like when you try to do it with pencils, color pencils. Some of them are amazing. Look, by adding a, an extra line next to a bed, for example, it looks like it's three-dimensional, right? Or for Jenny, who's going to start landscape drawings, look at this. You draw water here, and by adding that extra line in the perimeter of the built structure, it looks like there is a reflection in the water. Isn't it wonderful? All of those techniques you can apply both by hand or uh, even in the computer. Architecture is indeed a visual art, and the buildings speak for themselves most of the time, right? You walk around a municipality, you see the village hall, for example, you know what that structure it will be, or you see a building, you know that's a residential building most of the time, or if it's commercial, it's a silent communication, correct? But remember, all of this communication, all of those built structures, it starts. It always starts with a dream. Do you, do you ever think about it? Do you ever stop to think about it? Like a book, Marjorie. It starts with someone's dream, right? Everything around us starts with someone's dreams. It has many challenges to make it come true. It has many obstacles and tons of rules and regulations. But dream away, and that's how you make it happen. For bibliography, I would suggest for today's class, six books. Those are the three first ones. Designology is one of my favorites, and I'm sure you're going to enjoy all of most of these books. If not, all of them are available through our Westchester Library system. If we don't have it in Takaho, we can place a hold, and most likely Takaho will have it for us, okay? So you don't need to spend all the money. Those books are not cheap. Most of them are very expensive. This architectural graph 
weeks, standard design can be in the 300 category. It's expensive, yes. Um, but designology, it gives you a little bit of the psychology behind everything we design. Architecture inside out, you see again the section, you're gonna be able to understand how buildings work. That's a great book, great, great, great insights shared in a visual way. And the architectural graphic standard, it's a very deep book. It's not something you can just start reading and have a good time. No, it's a reference book. You use that if you really wanna get into details on how you're gonna draw things. So if you are getting into a, a more um, technical class, I would go for it. It gives you A to Z. It's almost the Bible of architecture representation. And these are the other three. Please feel free to take a photo. Design drawing is, again, more about drawing. And they do have videos available. So most of the time, um, I have old editions, right? But the newest editions will give you links where you can just go and start watching these videos. The How to Draw Buildings by Ian uh, Sedaway. It's also very nice. It's a step-by-step -step guide for beginners. They give us 10 projects and they go us through each one of those steps. And Drawing Architecture is another book uh, for beginners by Richard Taylor. And it's a guide uh, to drawing and painting buildings. That's very artistic. I think you're gonna enjoy it very much. Uh, more websites on this different subjects that we spoke about today, including a brief history of architectural drawings. Remember, I, you know me, by now you know that I love learning history. So we understand things and we have the passion for what we are learning, right? So some of these links, they give us a little bit of the history and also the design process, the power of drawing in architecture, because there is power behind this, yes. Um, now, next week, not next week, our next class, right? It's not next week. I'm sorry, I wrote it wrong. Our next class, the week number three, is supposed to be on October 12th. I do have a calendar conflict, and Miriam and I, we are trying to work on the new date. I think it's going to be back to back. It will be October 25th and 26th, which will give us enough time to come up with crazy drawings about everything around our home. And in the meantime, um, let's see. This is going to be about drawing and writing as an architect, right? We're going to be talking in more depth about how we do the drawings, how we do the calligraphy. Did you ever think about architects have all the same handwriting? You look at their uh, notes and said, oh my God, why do they all write the same exact way, right? We're going to understand a little bit more and we're going to practice. Um, Again, I would like to thank you all very much. Um, and today, dedicate a special thank you to the Takaho Library personnel who always go above and beyond trying to make this easy um, and affordable to our community and to the Westchester County Board of Legislators. Uh, they are a very important player in the community by offering this new type of access for the community to acquire knowledge. It's a lifetime treasure. So as you know, my email is there. Please feel free to email me with any questions that you may have. Um, I would be happy to get back to you as soon as possible. And remember, knowledge is a lifetime treasure, right? 